Greetings and thank you for watching. Apologies for my absence. I had a little bit of an accident. Uh, I fell and, and, and fractured my finger and hit my head. I'm fine. Uh, uh, I'm still healing my finger, but I had a huge hematoma uh, that I was waiting for it to disappear before making another video. But let's get right to it. Today, I wanted to talk to you about this book from my personal library by Richard Dawkins, The Extended Phenotype, published in 1982. Uh, Dawkins considers this as, uh, as a sequel to his more famous book, The Selfish Gene, where he defended the very controversial and widely discussed idea that genes are the units of selection, of natural selection in evolution, not organisms. He maintains this thesis in this book, but sort of uh, gener generalizes this and, and, and uh, uh, elaborates it in more detail, arguing, arguing for the idea of the extended phenotype, um, which basically says, says that uh, genes exert uh, effects on the uh, organism's environment, but only indirectly through the organism's phenotypes that are produced uh, via uh, protein synthesis. Uh, which is, according to him, the primary function of genes. Uh, and he identifies several uh, kinds of, uh, uh, of influences or effects that organisms have on their environments. Uh, and this is directly relevant to operant responding because we, we can uh, view uh, the, these effects, uh, especially if they involve uh, various behaviors uh, in terms of uh, operant responding. Uh, so that's re directly relevant to this. But the, the part I wanted to emphasize today that has had a, a huge influence on me and has uh, and, uh, and with which I have related very closely um, appears very early in the book. On page two, he says, and I quote, to understand the actual, we must contemplate the possible. Mind blown when I read that. I related to that very, very closely because that's precisely what I have been doing in my theoretical research with our neural network model. Uh, he continues uh, on page three, and I quote, playing with an imaginary world in order to increase our understanding of the actual world is the technique of thought experiment. At times, thought experiments are purely imaginary and widely improbable but this doesn't matter given the purpose for which they are made." End quote. Um, so, so this is exactly what I do. Uh, so, and that's why I relate so closely to this. And uh, um, computer simulations can be viewed as a sort of thought experiment. Okay? And even if they are unrealistic, that's all right. And he continues on page four, and I quote again, in this book, I shall make frequent use of the thought experiment technique. I warn the reader of this in advance, since scientists are sometimes annoyed by the lack of realism in such forms of reasoning. Thought experiments are not supposed to be realistic. They are supposed to clarify our thinking about reality. So in some, even a simulation, computer simulation with a model that is inconsistent with the evidence, with the animal evidence, for example, in the case of uh, conditioning models, uh, it's all right, it's not necessarily wrong. The model is false, uh, it's falsified, but that's not necessarily bad. Uh, if it helps us to think more clearly, to clarify our thinking about the phenomenon of interest. Take care, be well, and until next time.